Hello, everybody. Um, uh, nice to be with uh, you all today. Uh, my name is Andre. Um, I'm from Canada, um, and I'm really, really pleased um, to be with you today and talk about coaching girls and women um, in baseball. Um, for some of you uh, who don't uh, know much about me, um, so I've been I've been uh, with uh, with Team Canada. I've been working with uh, with Baseball Canada for. Um, about 20 years, um, and going back in time, um, in 2003, uh, I became um, the head coach of our first ever um, uh, national team, Canadian national team. And over the years, um, I've had the privilege of coaching these uh, wonderful athletes uh, throughout the course of um, eight world championship and uh, also um, Pan Am Games back in 2015. So that being said, as a, as, a, as a person, as a human being, as a coach, uh, I have to admit that those athletes have made me a better person along the way. Uh, and they've made me also a better coach uh, also in, uh, in all those years uh, that, I've, um, that I've spent with, uh, with those fantastic athletes. So, so today, what I want to be uh, talking to you is, is uh, the differences that I have found uh, over time between uh, between coaching um, boys or men uh, versus girls and, 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 and women. I've had the privilege also to, um, to teach and coach uh, boys um, earlier in my career. So I, I, mean, I think I'm in a position to uh, make those, uh, those differences. Um, and maybe one, one last thing I'd like to mention also is that um, when I decided to leave my position, as the head coach of the um, Canadian national team uh, after the 2018 World Cup, uh, I became right away the um, the head coach of the uh, France uh, national team, um, and we had the first ever European um, championship in 2019 uh, that uh, that we uh, were able to win uh, the gold medal uh, against the Netherlands. So that was another great a great experience for me, um, going back and teach um, again fantastic athletes um, back to uh, to uh, to a great country also. Uh, that uh, helped me a lot along the way as well. So as, as we move uh, towards this presentation here, uh, I, I want to discuss different things with you, but I wanted to, I, when I want to start with a video and, and this video uh, will make you smile probably, it will bring you back in time with an extract from a, a great movie uh, that, uh, that we've all seen before. Say, hey, Evelyn, can I ask you a question? You got a moment? Mm -hmm. Which team do you play for? Well, I, I'm a peach. Well, I was just wondering, because I couldn't figure out why you would throw home when we've got a two-run lead. You let the tying run get on second, and we lost the lead because of you. Now you start using your head. That's not love that's three feet above your ass. <laughs> Are you crying? No. Are you crying? Oh. Are you crying? <laughs> There's no crying. There's no crying in baseball. Why don't you leave her alone, Jimmy? Oh, you zip it, Doris. <laughs> Rogers Hornsby was my manager, and he called me a talking pile of pig shit. And that was when my parents drove all the way down from Michigan to see me play the game. And did I cry? No, no. No! <laughs> no! And you know why? No. Because there's no crying in baseball. There's no crying in baseball! No crying. What's the matter, Jimmy? All right, so so you, you probably smile a little bit. You saw the great performance again from great actors in this movie. Um, uh, Tom Hanks leading the way um, as as a male coach, um, coaching women's in that professional league um, that was in fact a reality um, uh, in in the previous century. Uh, but when we go back on, on in time, also like like those stereotypes that you have noticed while watching this, those videos um, are still present today. And if you allow me to go back in time and, and talk about this gentleman here, who've done a lot for the Olympic movement, this is uh, Pierre de Coubertin. Uh, and he's a gentleman at the origin of the Olympic games, um, who basically, like if you look, uh, if you Google his name, uh, some people will claim um, that, uh, that he's the inventor of the Olympic games. And I'll let you read um, what he said back then, um, which is it's not really uh, 
positive for him, uh, but that that set the stage a little bit for um, uh, the situation we're in right now and how we can all work together to give more opportunities for girls and women in sports. So Pierre de Coubertin back in 1912 said, we feel that the Olympic Games must be reserved for men. We must continue to try to achieve the following definition that the solemn and periodic exaltation of male athleticism with internationalism at its base loyalty as a mean art uh, for its setting and male applause as reward. So the sole role of women at that time, based on his comment, was for um, uh, women and girl to be, uh, girls to only be there to reward the winner. So that was his view at that time of the, um, uh, of the uh, Olympic movement. And if we look now at, um, at, at um, stereotypes that are still present in our society today, and still present in the mind of some of our coaches uh, in baseball and in other sports as well. So when you look at some of the adjectives um, that define a man or define a woman, uh, you, you're going to find those, those, those words. Um, and when you look at the left side of, of your screen right now, you look at the masculinity. Um, most, people, uh, most people will still today in 2021 identify male as being more confident, as being more um, uh, sportive, like uh, being in, in sports, uh, independent, leader, aggressive, dominator, and ambitious. And many people still today um, associate being shy, affectionate, compliant, kind, loving, naive, and sensitive for um, girls and women. Although in, in this, uh, uh, what I learned along the way is that for me as a, as a male coach dealing with, uh, with female athletes, if I do have an athlete that shows any of those stereotypes associated with men, um, I'm interested in having them. Um, so if you're a great leader, if you're um, more confident, or if you're ambitious, I don't see those words as being identified um, solely for male um, or could be for women also for the other words, I see them associated with human beings. Therefore, one of my first tip to you today is, uh, is to not see those words as being associated with men or women, but being associated with a human being, an athlete in our case. Therefore, don't put yourself any barriers uh, in order to select your athletes uh, for your teams. So like I like to say also, if you look at this diagram in front of you here, it's an ice rink, it's hockey rink, but no coach would want to play on only one side of the ice or would only like to play on defense or offense in baseball. You'd like to play on both sides. Therefore, you need to expand how you perceive human beings um, based on, 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 on stereotypes that's, that have been there for quite some time uh, uh, in our society. So, so back to the traditional stereotypes, um, female athletes are uh, often still today perceived by some coaches as being non-aggressive, gentle, dependent, cries a lot. You know, you've seen it in the video, emotional, submissive, and sensitive. While on the men's side, they're more being seen as being dominant, active, logical, tough, decisive, decisive, um, where they don't cry and a bit more aggressive. So for me, I don't see, as a coach, I don't see the difference between the two. Um, again, they're being seen um, by myself and our assistant coaches as um, uh, being human beings. So that's, that's one of the main things that I want to uh, come across here. And, and same with all kinds of other things um, that we see in life in general. Um, and this one will make you laugh also. Most people, when they, when they see this, They'll associate the big truck with, with the men, with, with boys. Where are they going to see this vehicle as being um, associated more with, with female um, person or women and, and girls? So, so I'd like you to think differently moving forward about those stereotypes and how we can destruct a little bit our thinking about how we see uh, the female athlete, especially in our sport. Uh, we recently have the International Women's Day. Uh, here's another good video that I want to show um, because I want to talk about confidence after. 
um, in talking with the differences between women's girls versus men, um, uh, men and boys. Nu har jag en liten jobbställe. Jag tänkte att jag skulle putta de blå ballarna i den ena vasen och de rosa i den andra. Okay. Ska vi ta de rosa i den och blå i den då? Nej. Ammont. Blå i den. Men nu ska du få belöning där. Er det for noe? Ok, og nå kan dere åpne øynene. Oi! Hva? Jeg fikk mer. Mali, grunnen til at du har fått mindre enn Thomas, det er faktisk fordi du er jente. Det er kjemperart. Det er ikke bra. Det er skikkelig urettferdig. Hva tenker du, Felicia? Vi har jobbet helt litt, og så får vi ikke det samme. Vi var like flinke, og vi burde få like mye. Hvorfor det? Fordi ellers så blir det urettferdig. Det er liksom ikke forskjell på jente og gutt, da. Jeg tenker at det er feil. Hvorfor er det feil? Jenter er ikke mindre verdt enn gutter. Det har ikke noe å si hvis man er gutt eller jente. Sånn, jeg tror det er like fint, da. Nei. Nå har vi det ikke mye. Nå har vi det ikke mye. So this video has been produced by Norway, so that's why we had the, um, the subtitles there. Um, but you probably see something interesting in the sense that um, when we start rewarding girls and women differently than boys and men, um, it has a, a clear impact on their confidence. Um, and, and confidence is, is something um, that is so important, not only in life, but also in sport in general, that we need to address uh, this problem. And, and let me show you some, some data about the differences between um, um, men and women uh, with regards to confidence. So uh, some research, recent research is showing that between the age of eight and 14 years old, girls' self-confidence decrease significantly and by 30%. So that tells you a lot about the fact that when we're dealing with, uh, with girls in sport, their confidence is also lower in general than male athletes. Therefore, as coaches, we need to play a significant role in, in trying to increase that self-confidence in the athletes. So one, they can perform better. And, and one uh, another thing also is that they can be even more self-confident in life in general also. So when we define the confidence for both girls and boy, here's what the, the research is showing also. So for the girl, um, confidence is proud of who you are as a person. Um, and, and for a boy is believing that you can accomplish anything you want. So we, we want basically to reverse this. And for coaches, whether you're um, male coaches or female coaches dealing with um, female uh, athletes, we need to help um, those athletes to understand and believe that they can also accomplish anything they want. Um, and especially through in our sport, um, where um, more and more um, uh, women are occupying leadership position uh, in sports, whether it's coaching, whether it's umpiring, 
um, whether it's front office with Major League Baseball or other organization, um, IOC, and so on and so forth. So we need to help them understand their potential so therefore they can achieve um, their, their goals and their dreams. And lastly, on confidence, before we get to the, um, the details of what I want to present to you today. So research showing that men overestimate their abilities and performance, while women underestimate both. So results are showing that performance does not differ in quality. So their perception um, of, of their abilities and performance uh, is different, but the actual performance is, not the, is, is, is about, about the same. So women will apply for promotion only if they meet 100% of the qualification, while men will go for it if they only meet 50% of them. So that tells you a lot about the self-confidence difference between the two and also the role we have to play as coaches also in order to change that. So what is stopping women is not their abilities to succeed because they can do as well as men, but what is stopping them is the choice not to do it, not to apply, not to play baseball, not to think that they can play on your national team um, and they just don't do it. Uh, and it's backed again to the self-confidence. Um, so going more to the technical side, the physical side of things, one thing for me that is really, really important as, as a coach is this. My goal is to bring those athletes to the top of the iceberg. And the top of the iceberg is fantastic because this is where we have the nicest view. This is the pinnacle of everything that you want to accomplish uh, as an individual, as an athlete. But if we want that iceberg to stay above the water, you need a good foundation. You need to invest in the physical, in the technical, in the tactical, in the mental, in the, in the life skills of your athletes, in the confidence I just talked about in order for that iceberg to remain above the water. And all those, all those things that I just mentioned is what you see underneath the water. It's the foundation. And if you forget to uh, pay attention to your foundation, therefore your uh, iceberg will not survive for long. And then you're gonna end up in that type of situation where you know the athletes will be a little bit more fragile. And when you're more fragile, when you have a little setback or you have an injury or you have a little problem, whether it's personally or professionally, then everything will collapse. So our role as coaches is to build that foundation that is uh, very, very important. And we need to think differently about it also. And Albert Einstein has, has mentioned something great years ago um, uh, about his own definition of insanity. And insanity for him was doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So this is a really, really powerful um, quote and slide um, that makes us think about how we approach the female athlete. And in some cases, while some countries or federation or coaches seem like, I'm not seeing any results, but you've never changed the way you approach the athletes or the way you do uh, programming for uh, for the female athletes. So let me uh, explain to you a little bit more about those elements that are important. So when we talk about athlete development, so I'm getting to um, the, the, the really specific of this presentation here. So when you look at athlete development, you look at three important sectors that will make a difference. If you're looking at the, the bottom of your screen right now, we're talking about physical literacy. Physical literacy is the fundamental movement skills that you're going to be developing between the age of 5 to 11 or 12. And that uh, are going to be the foundation for anything that you want to do in life after. Um, as, as, as we know, right now, tons of research are showing that there's a big dropout um, for uh, women's and girls' participation in sport around the age of 13, 14. Um, most of the time is confidence, is motivation, is the lack of programming and other factors. But if we develop good physical literacy, so if an athlete is capable of moving properly with confidence and with motivation and with competencies, um, our uh, chances of keeping them involved in our sports, and not only in baseball, but it's in sports in general, will increase. Therefore, um, they can move on to the top left of your screen 
It could be elite participation, excellence, um, like highest possible level, world championship, national teams, Olympic games, and so on and so forth. Or, which is also fantastic, is that they could be active for life. And maybe they can like give back to their sport by becoming an official, uh, becoming a, an umpire, becoming a, a coach also uh, moving forward. Or maybe they can just stay active and healthy for the rest of their lives. And if we accomplish that by putting good programming to, um, to our girls and women in, in, in our sport, we've accomplished something even bigger than our sport. And, and we are um, looking to do that through 10 key factors. And let, let me explain those, those key factors here. And the first one here is that kids are not adults in miniature. They have special needs. They have, um, they, they have um, needs that needs to be specifically addressed by coaches uh, at, at all ages. But for kids, sometimes what I see as a, as a problem is that um, we're going to, coaches will approach kids uh, from a high level perspective saying, okay, like I've, I've been a high performance athlete in, in women's baseball or any other sport. I'm going to replicate this with kids that I'm training, young girls that are developing in the sport of baseball. This is wrong because those individuals, those young girls do have special needs that needs to be addressed. Uh, by the coaches. The second concept here is that girls are not boys. I think I've, I've mentioned that um, uh, earlier to you, but uh, physically, um, girls have different needs than boys that have to be addressed also uh, by the coaches. And let me explain a little bit more in details what I mean by this. And what I mean by this is that there are sensitive periods that needs to be um, understood by coaches in order to get the most out of your athlete development. And this is where I, I want to talk about here with this next slide that I'm going to spend a bit of time to explain. So those sensitive periods of trainability means that in life, in, in the chronolo chronolo chronological um, uh, pathway of, 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 of a person, um, there are moments in your development where you should put more emphasis on some athletic abilities. And let me explain that. So at the, at, at the top of your screen right now, you're seeing um, uh, the graphic for female athlete, and at the bottom, you're seeing the graphic for male athletes. So let me explain one quick example here on the differences between the two. In general, uh, female athletes will mature earlier than male athletes. So young girls will mature earlier than young boys. So that, that's, we've seen it for ages and that's not going to change. Um, so in, in, in the graphic you're seeing there, for an example, if you're looking at speed development, so you're seeing speed uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the female side that is happening between approximately the age of six and eight years old, where you're seeing speed happening between about the, the age of seven and nine for boys. So that tells you something, regardless of the sport. As coaches, we need to um, put an emphasis on speed when you're dealing with young girls between the age of six and eight. It's paramount. It's so important. And at the same time, knowing that speed is important for baseball, it's important for other sports also. It is our obligation to serve the needs of the athletes, regardless of the sport that they're going to be choosing later on in life. So that's really, really important. If you look at, at skills, there is a moment between the age of, I would say, eight-ish to about 11, 12, where this is the golden age to train skills in, in the sports-specific environment. So basic skills, I'm meaning here, not advanced skills, but basic skills. So for little girls uh, playing baseball for the first time between the age of eight and, and 11 or 12, we need to put emphasis to, towards our basic skills of our sport. So hitting, running, throwing, receiving, um, those are important skills. Then arrives, happens something really, really important in our lives. And, and nobody can't escape it. We're all going through this and it's growth spurt. And at some point, 
And that can happen at any time between the age of 11, 12, to all the way to 15. Um, that's the growth spurt. This is where your body will be transformed. And if you remember your high school years, you probably remember that some of your friends um, were taller than others or smaller than others. There was all kinds of different um, differences between, between your friends at that age. So what you have to remember from this one here is when the growth spurt is starting, then it's a good opportunity for female athletes to develop speed again and stamina. Stamina is your, <clears throat> is your endurance your um, aerobic capacities that you should uh, put time into uh, development. <clears throat> so that's important. And when it's decelerating, uh, there is a moment, an opportunity there to work on strength development. Strength development is to lift, start lifting weights. And you're seeing that is happening only after, um, uh, the, um, after the growth spurt. So the question you might be having here is how do you measure that? And that would be a fantastic question. So the, the, the answer to this is pretty easy. So the first thing that grows in the human body is limbs, so arms and legs. So every two months, we should, me we should be measuring, measuring our athletes. Therefore, a simple test you can do is arm span. So you go against the wall, you extend your arms, and when you see those arm span growing, it means that the curve in, the, in, your, in your growth spurt is going up. You're starting your growth spurt because that's the first thing that is growing. And the indication that you're about to decelerate your growth spurt is, is the fact that your trunk will be the last thing that grows, meaning that you can be measuring a sitting height. So you sit on the floor um, against the wall again, and you measure from the, uh, the, the, the ground all the way to the top of your head. When you see that it starts to grow, it means that it's decelerating, meaning at the same time that strength training uh, could, could start. That doesn't mean that you can never work on strength earlier, but the conditions will be different and we will emphasize body weight um, uh, work uh, during uh, growth spurt. So those moments are important. Because some of you coaches might see, might have a great athlete, a great female athlete um, that has started to, uh, to grow really, really early. Um, tall athlete, throws the ball hard, uh, really, really dominating uh, during the age of 13, 13 14, 15. Um, <clears throat> but because you want to win so much, because your perspective is on short term and not long term, it means um, that later on in her career, uh, injuries will start to happen. So this is why it's so important to consider because um, you, 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 can, you can make an athlete in that particular um, uh, stage of development um, or you can break an athlete. And I've seen so many examples of athletes that have been broken because of bad management of, of, this, uh, of this situation here. So let me go a little bit more <clears throat> in details here about those uh, trainability. So I'm, I'm, I mentioned here um, that speed development uh, is something that you can train. You can always train it, decline significantly with age. I'm, I'm sure some of you listening uh, would, would agree that uh, trying to be um, faster at the age of 40, 50, it's a bit more challenging. Um, but the critical window of opportunity for females, six to eight years old, and then after 11 to 13. The key thing here, if you want to have access to that second one, okay, you need to, uh, to, 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 to put the emphasis on it in the first one. If not, you won't be able to have it. So, so the first, the kind of the first window could be different um, as far as what you're going to train um, versus um, what you're going to train in the second, the second window. Um, but again, the key thing here is you need to be able to tackle that first one before you think about the second one. So that's a big takeaway of this, uh, of this one here. The second one I mentioned also uh, earlier, skill development. Again, if you've tried to ski for the first time when you're 40 or 50 or skate for the first time or uh, do, um, uh, hit, the, hit a baseball for the first time, it's way more difficult when you're older. So it declines with age. 
So again, there is a window of opportunity for female athlete between the age of eleven of eight and eleven, um, and you need to take into consideration early and late specialization sports. In our case, we're talking baseball here. Our our, our best athletes are, are are not fourteen and fifteen, so you peak of performance is later in life. Therefore, you have the time to develop um, to develop skills. So it's not something you should be rushing. Um, it's important. Quality is more important here than than quantity. So when we say here importance of uh, transitional speed uh, skills, it means that if you've learned something in another sport prior to coming to baseball, that can help you. Um, achieve what you want to achieve in in um, uh, in, in the sport of baseball. Um, I I didn't talk about it, but there's some research also on flexibility that shows that um, uh, that there's there, there kind of there's kind of a window of opportunity between the age of eight and ten uh, as well to develop flexibility. Uh, for uh, for um, males and females, so that's something I wanted to uh, to mention also. Um, so back to what I just mentioned here, because we're um, a late specialization sport, there is something I like to say that's that excellence takes time, and there is no shortcuts to become the best you can be in your sport. So you need to see the journey of the female athlete as being long term versus short term. And winning a game on Friday night or winning a game next week uh, at the regional, provincial, national, or international level. So it takes a little bit more of a vision in order to develop an athlete long term versus short term. So that's an, an important takeaway also. So the 10 key factors, I've been through some of them quickly, but the 10 key factors are physical literacy. I've talked about it earlier. So the fundamental movements that you need to develop for athletes. Specialization, one thing to consider also, and I am giving you a little secret here from Canada, but um, uh, for us in Canada, um, for the national team, uh, having players um, with the ability to play multiple positions, I believe has been, has been a key uh, success factors um, over the years. So not having athletes specialize at a position too early um, will probably get you as a team to another level, but will get the athletes to another level as well because they do have appreciation of what um, uh, what the other positions are all about. Better understanding as well. Uh, developmental age also where you are in your progression will be important. Uh, we talk about trainability. Um, obviously, there are some moments in your progression, in your athlete development journey, that you should be focusing more on some aspects. There's the intellectual, emotional, and moral development that needs to be taken into consideration as well. I've mentioned excellent takes time. Periodization is how you're going to build your year, how you're going to build your season, how you're going to build those, those pieces and putting, putting them all together in order to achieve um, uh, a peak of performance at the right time. Uh, we need to be able to paradise and pick proper competition and to enter them also into the planning of the athletes. Um, we need to align the system. Sometimes in some countries, the system are so complicated that you can get lost easily. So that's another key factor. And the last one is Kaizen from my friends, Japanese, uh, or what it means in English, continuous improvement. So always looking for a better way of, of, of doing things. So a um, couple, couple more um, information to share with you. Um, so try to see the athlete. I, I like this image because it says a lot about, about the athlete. So the athlete is like the top of a table with four strong legs. And, and dealing with, with female athletes, you understand that the technical, the tactical, the physical, and the mental part are so important. And, and it, regardless if you're dealing with female or male athletes, this, you can apply this, this image to, uh, to uh, any athletes. So if you remove one leg from this table, let's say we remove the mental leg. We don't talk mental. We don't develop the mental side. The table will remain up. It will not collapse. Like you can try it at home if you want, <laughs> if you have the time. If you want to remove one leg from a table, the table will not collapse. 
It will be shaky, but it will not collapse. But the problem is that if you decide to sit on the corner of which you remove the leg from the, from the table, now it, it's going to collapse. So my point here is that if you never work on one of those elements, um, and if the game is requiring you or requiring the athlete to be stronger mentally, tactically, physically, and, and, and technically, the athlete will not be able to perform and therefore will have an impact on their confidence and therefore will not have any good performance. So as a coach, you need to be able to understand uh, that, that importance. And I want to I leave you with uh, two, two or three more slides uh, for you to understand what kids are saying about what they want from their coach. And again, uh, this is not a difference between um, female or male here. This is across the board. Respect and encouragement, being a positive model, clear and concise communication, have a good knowledge of the sport, and being a good listener. What I've noticed um, over my 15 years as, as, a, as a coach uh, of female athletes, um, being respectful, encouraging them, uh, offering them positive praises, um, catching them being good. So when I see them doing good things to tell them or to have a system where the other athletes will uh, share um, those encouragement between them, or have a system coach that will provide those positive feedback will go a long way. And, and when I talk also about being a positive model, um, how you behave, how you intervene with, with the female athletes will have a great impact also on their performance. Okay. And let me explain that a little bit more in detail here. Um, so there's three, um, three sections to this is identity, action, and emotion. And in this particular order, it's really, really important. Let's say that you're not happy during the course of a game, bad decision uh, from an umpire, maybe, or mistake from one of your female athletes on your, on your team. Um, some coaches will react with an emotion, right? They'll be not happy and their body language will not be positive. Therefore, they'll make an action. Maybe they're um, they, they argue with the umpire, maybe they will um, break a bat or whatever it is. So you make an action and, and, and that chain will define you as an individual. So every time you're not happy with something, you make a bad behavior. Therefore, it defines you as a coach, as an individual. Um, and when we talk about being a role model, this is not the message we want to send to our female athletes or athletes in general. So we want to reverse this. And using the same flow as you see on your screen right now is when you're not happy about something, you're going back to what's important for you. So you're going back to your own identity. You're making an action. And then that, that action will have an impact on other people's emotion. So it's the totally reverse um, uh, paradigm that, you, that we have here in order to create um, a better learning experience and better sports experience for our women's athlete at the same time. So I've, I've given you lots of information. Um, and, and this equation I like because it says a lot about, uh, about what we talked about is knowledge without action is nothing. So K minus A equals zero. Knowledge without action is nothing. So the question I have for you is, what are you going to do um, right now in order to implement some of those um, uh, elements, uh, knowledge that I shared with you today, because we have our friend Yoda in Star Wars that said at some point, you do or do not, there is no try. And keep that in mind. Every time you answer a question by, I will try to do something, I will try to implement something, you never do it. So you either do or do not, there is no try. I encourage you to try those strategies to pay attention uh, to those um, uh, different moments in the career of your athletes and their pathway and then long-term pathway so you can have a better impact. And at the same time, um, making sure that those athletes are uh, act actually reaching their own uh, potential. 
And, and finally, um, let's make sure that we all work together um, in order to um, provide as much um, experience uh, opportunities uh, as possible for girls and women in our, in our beautiful sport of baseball. So I thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm looking forward to your questions. And I'm also looking forward to meet some of you at some point during international competition or during seminars or any other um, events um, that are going to be organized uh, soon by the WBSC. So thanks again for having me. Um, and I remain available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.